Thank you, Inon Lesson. And thank you, everybody, for, for uh, being here. This is my second time on the RCGS uh, seminars. Um, and I'm here to, to present a recent idea I've been thinking about a lot recently, and I would like to, to discuss it with you since it's a work in progress. Um, let's see. Okay, this is a table of contents of, of today's um, um, presentation. There will be a short introduction, then a hopefully not too long part on theory and method, then a sort of overview of the directions I would like to move to investigate in, in, in the following months, and then a final case study to give a sort of more in-depth um, overview of what I'm trying to do. Um, let's start with a very short self-introduction. Probably most of you know me, but um, I'm a PhD in semiotics and media at University of Turin. And these last two years, uh, until the end of this April, I am been JSPS postdoctoral fellow at uh, the ritz Center for Game Studies. My research focus or research line is the interaction between uh, play, media, and um, cultural dynamics. And what I, if I have to summarize, what I try to do is to see how play as an object, so games or game-like um, uh, interfaces, and playing as an activity, and playfulness as an attitude change in the current media environment change and, and uh, um, determine the current media environment. So just to give a, a very short example for, for my PhD research, I've been investigating ludicization or cultural gamification or ludification. You can choose the name you prefer. And my main question was how and why certain objects and activity are increasingly designed and or perceived as games or under the label of playing activity or playful activities or um, used or, or performed with playfulness. So a very broad range of, uh, of objects that goes from gamified application on smartphones to the way we uh, follow, for example, TV series. Those two last two years, my focus has been on the representation of context of play in Japanese popular media. And probably you've already uh, heard me more than a couple of times talking about it. Uh, by context of play, I mean the time and space and social dynamics and all the conditions that enable play. So when we play, where we play, with which interface, in which level of formality, and so on and so forth. And I've been analyzing the context of play, especially game centers, uh, not by studying directly the, the empirical game center, the places itself, but mostly their representation in popular media. So how those places are represented, discursivized in manga, anime, TV series, and in digital games. And what I've been done was mostly analysis, textual and discursive analysis of uh, those works and a series of brief ethnographies of the context of play, such as uh, game centers or game tournament or meetings for games. But what about today? Today, I would like to talk of a specific side of this research, something that recently I've been more and more interested in. And it's even if I collected many materials in the course of those two years, I'm trying to look at them in a different direction. And this is what I would like to talk about today. And it's a work in progress. So any any sort of comment, criticism is highly welcome because I really feel I have to start once again looking at those things. And the object is specifically game centers represented, simulated, or in, in one word, incorporated in digital games. For short, I'll use the term virtual game centers. I'm not so sure about it, but VGS will be. So the, 
the premise of this, um, this idea is that uh, virtual game center are rarely discussed, even if they are um, present in all the history and not just the Japanese history of video game. Even when they are discussed, most of the, um, with a few exceptions, most of the um, discourse about virtual game centers is framed in terms of them being uh, tributes or trivia or Easter eggs or fourth wall breaking dynamics. Uh, for example, um, uh, Tales of Monkey Island. This is one of those examples that, or, or Zork and so on and so forth. Um, my idea, and this is the start of the premise that moved this research, my idea is that beyond that, which is quite clear, uh, beyond this sort of postmodern irony and playfulness, there is something more that generally goes under notice. And to summarize it, to anticipate it, my working hypothesis um, is that the incorporation of game centers in digital games make them become both a mirror and a prism to reflect on the medium itself. So virtual game centers as a form of self-reflexivity on the medium of games. And I use the term both mirror and prism uh, mostly as a sort of metaphor to specify that on the one end, they reflect these representations, they reflect the sociocultural conditions that created them. So we play a game in which there is a game center and we can see the discourse and rhetorics about game centers of that time, of that creator, of that kind of genre. But on the other hand, because they act as a prism, they refract, so differentiate. And so we can deconstruct the specific dynamics, the single dynamics that pertain to incorporating a game center in that game and the emergence of specific forms of play that are linked to these game centers. So uh, out of metaphor, uh, virtual game centers as objects trigger self-reflection and self-awareness on the medium itself, both in the authors, so in game designers, and in the audience, so in people who play those games and meet and encounter those game centers. Here, um, I don't like very much the picture, but uh, this is the picture that gives the title to, the, to this presentation. So it's the end of a game that I will mention later, Ge Game Uten Goku. And it's a moment in which the main character is looking at a cabinet, and because of a game of lights, basically, she's watching the cabinet that she was just playing, and then she sees herself and the cabinet simultaneously, and this is the highly reflective screen. Maybe if you play at the uh, game center, you've noticed when there is this very strong light uh, behind you, and there is this sort of reflection, reflection simultaneous that make merge what is behind you, the surrounding, and the, the surface of the game, especially with our cat of two. So what I mean by it is, and my idea is to uh, investigate those virtual game centers as theoretical objects. A theoretical object is an element of the medium, something that generally is represented inside the medium that requires theoretical effort to be incorporated in the medium. So you can't simply create a game and put a game center without any problem in, in, in it in terms of mediality. And simultaneously, they trigger a metaludic experience or so reflection by players once they encounter this object when they play. And this second part, will be about me trying to explain this concept of theoretical object, which is not mine, and trying to um, propose a way to adapt it into digital games. So the term theoretical object was uh, adopted, used by Hubert Damisch and used by the French Theory of Art group 
So Daniela Ras, uh, Omar Calabrese, Giovanni Careri, Luis Maran, and Victor Stoichita. And in Damish idea, a theoretical object is something that meets three prerequisites. So, or at least if we want to look at something as a theoretical object, um, it should follow these three main lines. The first one is that a theoretical object raises a problem for a medium. So something that you know, is, is problematic in terms of representing and incorporating it. This problem can only be solved by a theoretical effort, generally by the creator, the, the game designer in our case, or the artist. But the object itself pro also provides the tools to create a new theory in order to incorporate itself in the medium. This is the general idea. And because it has been used by different authors, there are three, at least three different uh, takes on or three implementation of this idea of theoretical objects. And all three, to me, can be used in some way to discuss about ga virtual game centers. The first one is the one by Damish. And in, according to him, in early modern painting, once the linear perspective is established, the object cloud become problematic. It become problematic because the linear perspective require things to have volumes, to be measurable, to have distance, to have, and the cloud is formless, non-measurable. And for this reason, because linear perspective is invented and created, there are some elements of the representation that can't follow directly linear perspective. And so those elements, that is clouds, are put in the background of representation. So here you can see Leon Battista Alberti. And in all Italian early um, Renaissance, you will see that all linear representations, they put the clouds at the background of the representation. It's not part of the stage. It's something that is attached at the end. However, for Damish, the idea is to study once the all the manifestation of clouds in different forms of painting from early modern up to the impressionism to look for how they accompany forms of distractions of linear perspective or alternatives to the theories of linear perspective. One example is this one is Correggio's fresco. Uh, the Assunzione di Maria. Here, so a bi-dimensional picture doesn't really uh, make you tell, but the idea is that this huge architecture, this huge cupola, when you look at it, you have a three-dimensional experience, and this three-dimensional experience that is not linear works because you have this spiral of clouds surrounding. So the three-dimensional structure of the architecture and the use of cloud as a device provide an alternative to linear perspective. This is the idea. And if, while Damish follow this idea, he looks for the ways in which reflecting on clouds bring alternative forms of visibility in the history and theory of paintings, such as here you, you can see Cezanne, the impressionist, but there is also a line a history of all theoretical authors that used clouds in order to get out of this idea of linear perspective and feel different ways about the atmosphere, the visibility of paintings. This is the idea. The second implementation is by Victor Stoichita. So in his work, the self-aware image, he talks about meta paintings. So paintings from early modern age, once again, that represent other paintings. And all the forms of incorporation and framing and reframing that accompany those paintings. Um, here you can see an example of Pete uh, Ertsen. I'm, I'm not sure if I am spelling it right. And you can see that there is a frame, a, a religious topic, 
should be Christ with Martha and Maria in the background. And then in front of it, you have a still life, so another typical subject for painting, and people discussing and commenting around it. So what Stoichita does is suppose that those meta paintings represent the moment in which many painters and authors began discussing and reflecting on art as a separate object. So art as something that is not anymore linked to our religious specifically dynamics or dynamics of power and um, representation of kings and so on and so forth. And furthermore, what he does is analyzing specifically uh, techniques and devices and elements that appear once the meta painting become to um, become to uh, be diffused. So, for example, here you can see this two paintings of the series of the uh, Eve drop Eve uh, ears droppers. Sorry, Van de Mes. The first one on the top, you can see the comment, what is called a commentator. So this is a character that looks at the spectator and points something in the frame, in the scene, a specific frame, in order to establish this sort of visual mute communication. And the second one is, for example, the trompe play. So once we have this idea of creating a painting um, in terms of frames and different layers uh, em embedded one inside another, you can develop the idea of trompe play, so something that is uh, that looks like not being part of the painting, but instead being part here. On the bottom, you can see this um, this drape, and the drape is painted. So the drape is part of the painting, but you initially don't realize unless you get really close. And you would probably get close because this is part of the eavesdropper series. And so you know immediately that there will be something uh, behind. And last implementation is um, not linked to a single author, but is the idea of making theoretical objects out of a single work, a single piece of work, a uh, single painting, for example. So uh, both Foucault, as you know, Stoichita and Louis Maran discuss and analyze Velázquez's uh, Las Meninas. It's probably one of the most famous paintings. And their idea is that Las Meninas is simultaneously a painting, a meta painting, so a painting that describes a theory of art, a painting that describes a theory of knowledge, this is Foucault's idea of uh, Baroque episteme manifested uh, by Las Meninas, and, according to Marin, a theory of power. So if you look at the way the power is represented, mirrored, and, um, and looked, in Las Meninas, you will see the theory of how absolute power works and the representation of kings works in the absolute state. So something that is immediately at the center and everywhere because it can be reproduced. And this idea that a single work uh, can simultaneously be interpreted according to different layers and provide different theories that are not contradicting themselves, on the contrary, is another form of theoretical object. In this um, painting, so there is no time to, to analyze specifically and not the right person to do it, but the way the mirrors work, the way the different frames and the gazes of people works and the way the stage is constructed, all interact in order to create an experience of visibility. So once again, being based on the fact that there is a spectator there that is at the core of the medium of painting. So the idea is that uh, this painting make people aware of what being spectators of a painting is simultaneously. So, um, but now the next question, how do I plan to use these ideas and 
would they work in in terms of anal analyzing games? So for me, theoretical object is a lens to discuss those three different implementations, um, translating them to the medium of games. So first, game centers as problematic objects that may undermine a series of dynamics uh, or rhetorics that we connect links to the medium of games. So the idea of prelusory goals, so the fact that once we start a game, we are playing with the idea to follow the game rules and objective. The, uh, simply put, suspension of this belief, so because of the meta uh, dynamics of uh, game centers, once you meet game centers inside uh, a game and you realize you're playing in the same place that you're seeing there, there is a, a shifting in your uh, suspension of disbelief. And then the rhetorics of immersion. I, I don't like the term immersion very much, but I think that the rhetorics of immersion is definitely a thing that has worked and has been used in game studies for quite a long time. And I would say that looking at game center make us understand the limits of this idea of immersion and alternatives to the idea of immersion. Um, second point, game centers as the object that triggers reflection on games and play by game designers. So on my um, understanding is that at a certain point in time, uh, Japanese game designer began uh, creating and implementing game centers in their games as a way to comment and discuss and reflect on the state of the industry and the state of the game arcade industry. And third point, game center as a ludic setting that produce meta theory on the experience of play and life. So certain games make the players reflect on their experience as players when they interact with game center. Um, but until now, I let's say I discussed this idea of theoretical objects in very abstract terms. So my further point will be a theory of what. So specifically, what kind of theory can we extract or discuss looking at game center? First, because uh, as you have you've seen I discussed three different implementation of the idea of theoretical objects that are linked to different theoretical understanding of the medium. And second, because if we want to be, if I want to be precise, I'm not exactly um, discussing the same kind of object that I showed you when talking about painting. So uh, I'm not explicit, I'm not exactly talking about the mise en abeam of games, so games inside games, because I started talking, discussing about game centers, so a context for play. And I'm not investigating the representation of game designers, for, while, for example, in Las Meninas, you can see the painter being there at the, the left side of the representation. And in many forms of meta painting, you will see the painters generally as part, as one of the main subjects of the representation triggering this sort of uh, uh, self-reflexivity. So more specifically, um, my understanding is that game centers can mediate a theory about play context and the contextualization of play. So if I were to find uh, adequate uh, uh, painting in order to show, to, to find the parallel between the games I will be analyzing and the theory of art, it would be probably Bruegel the Elder, the children's play. So it's showing a place in which people play and they are performing playful activities. This is the idea. So what do I mean by context and contextualization of play? On the one hand, for play context, as I said before, I consider all those conditions that enable play 
and frame play. I don't want to say surround because it's more complex than that, but let's say the frame play. So context of when we say context of play, we may mean time and space in which we play, the sociocultural dynamics, so people with which we play, how formal the playing uh, performance is, how professional it is, and the techno-human assemblage. So we are playing with what, with which technologies, in which play, in which plays in terms of architectural properties and so on and so forth. On the other hand, by contextualization of play, I mean the fact that societies, technology, uh, game designers and players all frame and discuss play in terms of access, values, and effects of play. So in uh, every culture, especially uh, industrial cultures, you will see discourses about when it's right or wrong to play, people, how long you should play or not play, why you, why certain game is not made to be played for too long, or how different it is to play as a professional at the professional level versus playing with friends. All those are for me contextualization of play. And here I'm following the Foucault from the order of discourse. So the idea that society needs to limit and give shape to the playful activities. So, and I'm at the end of this part on the method. Sorry if it was very heavy or dense. How do I move from the theory of art to the analysis of games? In terms of what I will do, uh, my idea is mostly to do textual and discursive analysis of games, of course, as well as looking for the sources and discourses of game designers and industry about games at the time in which the games I've been analyzing were released. And also connect those two dimensions with the social cultural background and, of course, all the literature about culture and social cultural dynamics of play. And in terms of the analysis, for me, moving from art um, paintings to video games mean this shifting from representation to incorporation. So I'm not just looking at how the game centers are represented, but how game centers are simulated, for example, or interact with the players. And moving from an, an experience of visibility to an experience of interaction. So it means once a game center is inside a video game, what happened for us? How do we interact with it? And what kind of uh, awareness or reflection in terms of experience of play do we have? And lastly, of course, from a aesthetic discourse, a uh, reflection on art or non-art, to a uh, discourse on play or ludicity in terms of ludic experience in relationship to life and culture and society. Um, and this was the end of the part about the method. So what I would like to do now is try to um, present a few of the directions of the, the specific um, objects that I would like to analyze and the way I am understanding it in this moment. So I'm following different directions and I'm not sure if the way I'm uh, dividing them is appropriate or the one that will make me understand them. Also, you know, any sort of uh, um, comment on this will be really helpful. So, and the general structure is that I have at least four directions of this research that I'm investigating. One is tied to the emergence of virtual game center. So when we start to see game center in video game, in Japanese video games. The second is about how game center um, are become a medium to simulate daily life of people. The third one is how game center become an interface to mediate nostalgia and the access to video games we don't have access anymore. And the last one is the changes in Game Center as a space under the 
cultural, social cultural dynamics of cool Japan that involves to me a, sort of a re-spatialization of the boundaries of play. And each one of these direction is linked to certain games in a specific historical context, but and to certain dimensions, certain aspects of the contextualization of play and context of play. However, I would say that each one of them has several developments over time. So it's just the starting point for something that keep happening and certain features of game center or virtual game center that we still have. Um, starting with the first one. So around the mid eighties, you, uh, we uh, start seeing game centers appearing in digital games. Like for example, uh, Seishun Scandal on, on the top here, you can only see and not interact with the game center there, or in uh, Sanmano Meitan Pei that was um, suggested to me by the Replay in Japan uh, reviewers, and I'm really grateful for that, is um, an example of one of the first time in which we enter a game center and we can play a parody of Galaxian, Krabaxian. Um, in my mind, the, uh, the emergence of game centers around the mid to late 80s um, is a form of represent a form of self-reflexivity of the game designers that try to um, answer a series of problems in term in by representing game center at the crossroads between a certain dynamics that may favor the representation of game centers for example technology the technological evolution make it possible to represent with more details the backgrounds air and the internal parts of the shops or, or uh, buildings on the other hand there are conditions, historical conditions, that go against the representation of game centers. So after the 85, the Xin Yo law is enforced, and the negative public opinion towards game center is at one of the highest moment in, in time. There are also certain changes, uh, such as the changes in the cityscape or the new industry trends, such as new genre for example, the beat em up that may go towards easing or making more difficult representing game centers. And so my idea would be to try to analyze the emergence of this game center, understanding what are the variables, the dynamics that make it possible or make it more problematic to represent game centers in this moment. And for me, a very important text in this term is Golden Axe the 1989 fantasy action beat em up by Sega. Um, here, you're seeing the last part of the ending of the arcade version of Golden Axe. So what happened is you complete the game, you see that you were playing a game inside the game, and the monsters and characters jump out of the screen and then this part, uh, sorry, I couldn't put it in the GIF. Then they exit the game center and they run in the city. Um, for In many ways, for me, this choice, of course, is a fourth referential, fourth breaking of the fourth wall. There is some sort of ludic irony and so on and so forth. But it's also um, a moment in time in which a game that had no need to do this sort of uh, parody, this, this sort of ironic play, decide to show the characters of a game inside a game center with reference to uh, Taikan games, and then getting out in the city. And after 1989, there is a multiplication of representation of game centers as part of the cityscape in beat em up in fighting games and so on and so forth. So here in the last, last plausible example we could find, we had this sort of declaration 
of framing the activity of playing games outside an, any idea of fantasy or immersion. And in the 90s, this will continue. And this is one of the first direction I would like to investigate. The second one happens during the 90s, and it refers to all those games in which game centers are part of a simulation of life activities, daily routine of teenagers. So play, the activity of playing becomes gamified because through the mediation of game centers. Typical example you can see is Tokimeki Memorial. Tokimeki Memorial, uh, you know, is a dating simulator and it's also a, a student's life simulator. In this game, you can uh, you have your schedule and you decide many activities, what you want to do uh, during the day, but you can't play at home. You can only invite um, schoolmates to dates at the game center. And so the game center is being framed in terms of a possible location for social interaction, romantic social interaction, and it's being contextualized in terms of the discourses that your potential partners will make about the suitability of game centers as a romantic spot or as a place for spending your time. And in my mind, Tokimeki Memorial is the first, but not the last game that use game center as a way to explicit a discourse on when it is appropriate or not appropriate to play under which conditions, who can play. For example, you, you'll see here the example. So you will see here that many of the answers uh, of the feedback given by your partner, the one you invite, will of 90% of the time be, I don't think that girls should be here, or I am not used being here because this is a game center. So the very game, uh, make you aware of this sort of gender dynamics around 1994, 1996. And this is only the first sort of game we can make a sort of a thread that goes up to Persona 5, that once again has a schedule and time appointment dynamics in which you have to decide when and how you want to play, and in which going to the game center, as you can see here, is also framed in terms of what people should go there, why we shouldn't, how many people go and how much and how society will think about you, will, will say what will say about you when you go to the game center. The third one is the idea that um, around the mid to end of the 90s, you know, arcades are not the leading platform anymore for games. And... Uh, Virtual game centers are increasingly linked to forms of retro nostalgia. And in my mind, as far for what I understand, they become sort of nostalgic interfaces. So interfaces that make it possible to access form of play for games that are not available anymore or believed to be not separated by us. So the opposite of the daily activities. And these works highlight the limits of access to play because of the technology, because of changing trends, and because of time. And um, sorry, one of these examples is Game Tengoku. It's a vertical shooter that works like Parodius. So it's a parody of vertical shooters that is set inside a game center. And there is a narrative frame, so an evil scientist uh, hijack this game center and you as the only uh, employee at the time uh, find your old um, Coleco arcade boards and use it to reverse the hacking. And so the player needs to destroy the game center in different stages in order to take um, back the control of the game center. And what you do as a player is basically going through destroying all the history of arcade video games from the start until uh, up to the 3D. And when you finally win, uh, you take control back of the game, your, the old Coleco characters, the old arcade board, they disintegrate, they malfunction. 
And this is the sort of uh, Mabius loop that tells a story or make us reflect on the obsolescence of arcades, on the obsolescence of game technology and certain game genre, because this is also a reflection about vertical sh shooters that were at the time, basically at the end of their success. However, once again, this is not a history that starts and then with game Tengoku, but there is a whole thread of arcades as looting digital interfaces that make us mediate with the past of games. Here you can see Capcom Arcade Museum, and there are many other more that use the uh, digital setting of the arcades in order to give us back the sort of experience that is lost because of the technological limits. And the last one um, is the space for leisure under Cool Japan. So what I mean by that is that during what we call Cool Japan, not just as a brand strategy, but also as a social cultural dynamics, the representation of play and the self-understanding, self-representation of play in Japan changes. And this change has some effect in terms of the spatial limits and boundaries of play. And I would say that even if game centers are not at the center stage anymore, they provide a specific perspective position where we can look at these changes. And so virtual game centers become part of a broader discourse on entertainment districts, Akihabara, for example, uh, playful media and endless and the state of endless leisure. And here you can see two games set in Akihabara, so Steins Gate or Akiba Strip, and both of them, they put at the center of the stage this reflection on playful Japan or playfulness in Japan using the entertainment districts as the setting in order to explain contemporary society. And both of them, they have a specific quite complex relationship with game center. But one of the series, according to me, that could be uh, more interesting to look at this transformation and change is Ryuga Gotoku, so Yakuza series. Uh, the arcades over the eight uh, titles of Ryuga Gotoku uh, incorporate a paradigm show up, are specifically one of the most important elements in order to see the shifting from a, sto a Yakuza story where the possibility to enjoy the nightlife of uh, Kabukicho is just a diversion, is a setting, to a, sort, a game in which you want to get lost in this infinite jest. So the multiplication of mini games activities, the multiplication of endless form of pleasures that take you um, back from the story, that ask you to stop progressing through the story and doing something else, for me, is a, works as a paradigm of this idea of infinite jest and cool Japan as an infinite land where there is no beginning and end to playful form, playful activities. And each one of the titles of Yakuza focus on a specific aspect of the contextualization of play and our access of play. So here, for example, I'm showing Yakuza uh, 0 on... Uh, in the top, or Yakuza 5 in the bottom, that have very specific discourses about games and nostalgia on the one end, or games as the trendy experience, extreme experiences. So um, to sum up, these were four main directions that I'm trying to reflect on. And what do they have in common. The idea that Game Center emerged as trigger for meta-reflection on play context and the contextualization of play, uh, as I said, both for game creators and for players, and that they make us reflect on the enabling conditions for play, so who, when, where, and with what and whom we play, while they incorporate the rhetorics and critics of their time 
uh, over the norms and limits of play in society. So uh, how we should or shouldn't, or how much, how long, where, and so on and so forth, play games. And in general, some of those games, they provide a broader theory of play and the boundaries of play. So the relationship between play, non-play, and life. And with this last point, I would like to briefly present a, a case study to, to show what I mean by doing a sort of textual analysis of, theoreti of these theoretical objects. And this is Shenmue. So uh, Shenmue, you, you will probably know, is the adventure game for Dreamcast produced and directed by Yu Suzuki. And when Yu Suzuki uh, created this game, he highlighted the idea that it was a new genre that he wanted to love, love free, so full reactive eyes entertainment, and was tied in his mind to, this is me rephrasing, a different form of immersion. So an immersive experience, because the degree of interactivity with the world uh, was, and to a certain degree, it still is, um, unprecedented, unprecedented. The game is set in Yokosuka in 1986-87, and it follows Ryo Hazuki in his path for revenge, so wanting to uh, avenge the death of his father. In the game, um, you can freely uh, explore the city and visit, enter, and interact in many shops. And one of these shops is the Game Center U that can be found in the commercial street of the Buita and accessed freely. It's one of the few shops that is always open. Um, inside, you can play emulated versions of uh, Sega Taikan games, classic, both designed by Yu Suzuki, so Hang On and Space Harrier. And you can also play other games such as a virtual version of Darts, and uh, to QTA cabinets. So uh, as you know, QTA, the um, quick time events, begins, let's say, with Shenmue, or at least Shenmue popularized the idea of quick time events. And uh, of the two cabinets with quick time events, one of them is modeled on a Sega game, uh, mechanical games, um, while the other is completely created just for, for Shenmue. So it's, uh, the name of the game is Big Title, and in, in Shenmue becomes QTA Title. So, uh, sorry. The Game Center U could be considered, and by a few people has been considered, just as a typical minigame-based side activity. So that sort of side activity that you uh, meeting games such as Zelda, for example, fishing in Zelda, or in many Final Fantasy games, uh, you have certain mini games progressing towards the story. Those side activities, I'm simplifying, it, it's more complex than that, but uh, please bear with me. Those side activities often, they are separated from the main progress of the game. So once you unlock those side activity, you are not forced to play them anymore. And if you play them, nothing changes in terms of the final uh, completion of the games. And vice versa, what happened on the outside world doesn't influence the fact that you already unlocked the, the, the side activities. This is not true for all games, but let's go with that. Those side activities may provide certain bonus or feedbacks or rewards in terms of playing the game. For example, if you fish in Zelda and you catch a very big fish, you will be awarded a heart container. Or in certain Final Fantasy, you can obtain, uh, you can win money, which you use to, to purchase, to buy other equipment, or you can win specific equipment that you will not have access in other forms through the game. However, in my mind, Shenmue uh, diverges from the idea of game of uh, game centers and those mini games as a side activity for a few reasons. The first one is that playing at the virtual game centers has no useful rewards for beating the game. So 
if you play there you and you obtain very high score, you will obtain some toys. Those toys have no effect whatsoever on your game and they will not change the ending. And in the original Shenmue that had no achievement, you don't even know if you completed the series of toys. So it's a completion, but when the game gives you no clue about how long it will take for you to complete the series. Furthermore, if we want to talk in terms of gain, gaining and efficiency, you lose money and time when playing games at the U Game Center. You need money for other activities in Shenmue, and you lose time, which means that you may lose the possibility to talk and meet certain other um, um, non-playable characters that are, because of their schedule, they are in certain places only in specific times. So you may spend too much time here and uh, have unintended consequences for the story. Also, uh, two times during the game, you need to enter the arcade in order to progress the story. And inside the arcade, you need to fight. So unexpectedly, what is usual, usually a dedicated uh, special environment for a side activity is invaded by another form of gameplay. So you will never fight in uh, the fishing zone in Zelda, for example. You, you will never have any form of combat in the golden saucer, well, in the arcade part of the golden saucer. They are dedicated spaces, virtual spaces. And this doesn't happen in Shemu. It's the opposite. You do not expect to fight there and then you, there is a fight twice. Uh, but the most important element is how the activity of playing is framed according to the time flow dynamics in Shenmue. So uh, as I said, in Shenmue, every non-playable character has its own schedule and will be in different parts of the town in different moments. And what happens is that when you search for somebody, people will tell you, oh, probably you can meet this person tomorrow in at 4 p.m. here. And so because there is no way to fast forward time in Shenmue, you have to live the life as Ryu, Ryu until that 4 p.m. of the day after. And you have these moments of free time, free from the main quest, the main idea, the, the uh, uh, prelusory goal that is diegetically defined by playing Shenmue. So this separation between free time and time dedicated to your revenge initially may be understood as a typical gameplay device. So the one between main and side activities and the one between the so-called heterotelic activities. So the one, the, those activities we do in games because we know we will beat the game by doing those. And so those are activities that we understand as tools to reach the final goal versus the autotelic activities. So the one we do inside the game because we just like the activities in itself. However, the game center you first uh, blurs this opposition and then subverts it. So it blurs because of what I said before, there is no complete separation between the side activity and the main activity. And in many cases, you will you will have overlapping in those terms. And because of the time dynamics, you can't just do one without doing or not doing the other. And second, because it frame the act of playing at the game center by making us experience the temporal and spatial condition that are necessary to play the game. So when we play Shenmue, we realize that we have some free time. And so we can choose if we want to spend this free time at the arcade or do something else, for example, training. Uh, we may go playing the game at the U arcade, and then we may realize, because the time is ticking, that we missed an important appointment. Or we may go to a shop and realize that we don't have money because we play too much at the arcade. 
Uh, while blurring these boundaries, my understanding is that the experience of the you game center leads to a, a critique of games as autotelic and separate activities. So to me, the, um, the way towards immersion of Shenmue is not a way towards immersion that works by eliminating or erasing the traces that we are playing a game, as it happened in, for example, Western developers in the seventh and eighth generation of consoles, where they remove all the element, non diegetical elements that tells us that we are playing a game. But on the other hand, it works on the other with the other solution. So to make game and show us game as part of a broader frame of life and showing that the separation between the domains of life, working, playing, uh, doing nothing and so on and so forth is all inside the game. So by incorporating play instead of erasing play from the diegetic and representational or simulational aspect of the game. And this is to me correspond to a meta theory that brings self-reflexivity -reflex on the act of the very act of playing games. And this is how I understand Shemmo in, in in this moment in time. So this is the conclusion. I'm sorry if, uh, if it was too, too long and dense. Uh, I don't have specific conclusions more than those reflections I have discussed with you. Uh, maybe a sort of summary. The way I am understanding in this virtual game center is that they work as objects that trigger self-reflection in their creators and self-awareness on the medium itself when we play them. And, and I'm trying to use this idea of theoretical objects as a lens to analyze the effort and problems that game designers met when incorporating those virtual game centers, as well as the metaludic experiences that players um, experience uh, when, while playing those games and trying to understand those in the general um, context of the historical, social, and cultural development of the medium of games. So ideally, if this can be brought further, it's a different way to understand how a medium evolved, not thinking in terms of top-down changes to the medium, but thinking in terms of bottom-up changes and innovation to a medium that happened through the very medium itself. And this, I hope, could be a different way to look at the games by trying to merge, on the one end, the theorization of researchers with that of designers, and the history that is done by production studies with the history of cultural idea that is done by cultural studies. I don't know if, if I'm, I'm going in the right direction, but you know, any suggestion or criticism is uh, very welcome. And thank you.